Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 226th New Social Environment. I'm Emily, a PA at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for the 23rd Radical Poetry Reading curated by Drew Pham. We're also thrilled to have the poets Lior Styler, Benedict Gen, Erica Dane Kielsgaard, and Marcus Scott Williams here with us today. To begin, I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation, the traditional owners of Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters on which we stand. Finally, the Brooklyn Rail stands in solidarity with the uprisings in response to the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Nina Pop, David McAdey, James Skirlock, Jamel Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Rayshard Brooks, Rhea Milton, Dominique Remy Fells, Toyin Salau, Walter Wallace Jr., and countless others we have lost to white supremacy and police violence in this country, and acknowledge that justice will come from the streets, from the nation demanding accountability, and refusing to move on until Black Lives Matter in the eyes of the state. Before I introduce our curator, we'd like to begin with a brief moment of silence. Thank you. And now to introduce today's curator. Drew Pham is a queer transgender writer of Vietnamese heritage, a child of war refugees, and an adjunct English lecturer at CUNY Brooklyn College. Previously, she served in the US Army and deployed to Afghanistan with the 10th Mountain Division. She has published in Blunderbuss Magazine, McSweeney's, Slice Magazine, Foreign Policy, Time Magazine, The Daily Beast, and Columbia Journal, among others. She serves as an editor at the Wrath Bearing Tree, an online literary journal focused on themes of societal violence. She lives and works in Brooklyn, New York. Drew, take it away. Hi everyone. Uh, as Emily said, my name is Drew Fum and I'm so excited to bring uh, these four extremely talented poets to the Brooklyn Rails Radical Poetry Reading. Uh, I selected uh, Lior, Erica, Marcus, and Benedict specifically because I knew that they're poets who are always seeking to transgress boundaries and trespass into new territory, uh, both politically and personally in their own work. And so I'm just so excited, especially because this year seems to be a year in which those transgressions against uh, that which is held normal, though it oppresses so many of us, these principles of supremacy and bigotry um, <clears throat> and exploitation, uh, that voices like theirs are incredibly necessary. Um, to begin with, uh, I would like to introduce our first reader, uh, my good friend Lior. Lior Styler is a poet and fiction writer living in New York City. Their interests include digital game making, Jewish folklore and ritual, bodies of water and gay joy. They are an MFA candidate in the poetry program at CUNY Queens College. Go ahead and take it away, Lior. Hi, everyone. Drew, thank you so much for curating this and inviting me to read. And also thank you to the Brooklyn Rail for putting this on and Emily and everyone else for organizing this. And also Marcus, Erica, and Benedict, I'm really happy to be reading with you. I'm going to start with a cover of a poem written by C.A. Conrad. This is Neptune 2. Let it evaporate under the eyelid, become an open sign for others, an opening in the throat, a knife, a crowbar, a strong arm prying it. We needed the standing up prayer the most, he said, while in misinterpreting our hatred. But we stand and watch them calculate, making the backlash marketable. 
with ghosts from last time still pouring over us. We cram our pink organs back inside to return the fight. This one is by me. It's called Cameras. With the security cameras to record only a bright glare of light, to make patterns so clashing that webcams close their eyes. No more fears of followers or stalking. Hopeful. Our desires can't be fully predicted by the internet, especially as they grow stranger, the slow inversion of what is and is not sex. Against the narrowing of wants, can our true selves ever be fully dragged into the public public places? What true selves? To become even less recognizable, except by scent, wandering the woods at night, where mosquito boys will drink my blood and alter me forever. This is a couplet, a translated couplet written by Jean Elia. I am strange, so strange that I self-destructed and don't regret it. This is called grief ritual. One, bed sweat imprint, salt stains on the sheet, cursive hair spirals in the dream, avoiding your eyes in the photos, walking seven blocks to sidestep rain, swallowing the few tears shaken loose by schisms, drinking too much but never throwing up. Two, paint bubbles swell like frog throats, burst like bubbles, releasing paint smoke and I noticed there aren't any kids. At 22, I would have been the one laughing and burning bridges. I miss the people who aren't here. Her and I link arms and lean into the precious void. If I have to turn bad to stay by your side, I will fold my heart in half and not look back. Light is stuttering on tree leaves. The fire is glitching. We jump around it like dancing dogs. Your peoples are sucking as vortexes. And on the grass at night, we echo downwards pushing through rings that swell and echo, loosening around knuckles. The stars dissect our eyes, pouring light into this small passageway just left of my lacrimal caruncle. The secret voice your throat releases, piss steam rising from frozen ground, mist from spray paint cans, flag smoke, rise up into the nothing that you are part of now. Tears and sweat stay, and dogs will come lick up the piles of salt. Here are a few very short poems. Never, never sharpen their knife. They will try to cut our friends soon enough. Memory. All love and protection to those who use memory as a weapon. Research. Against the pulling that turns looping letters into lines. A snake is entering and leaving me at the same time. The threads of warped surnames are re-entangling. This is called Happy Memory House 13. One. The next morning, they were practicing Ode to Joy on their keyboard for the CUNY music program they're in. They decided to practice it on every instrument they had, including the bongos, and also to sing it many times throughout the apartment. Two, I hugged her also and said, you're as warm as sunshine. She laughed. Three, candy jewel pinpoints on the dark leaves and a larger, softer, rippling light like you're underwater. Four, I climbed in through the window and left the flowers in a jar on their porch. Five, as you walk into the dark, you'll disappear to us and you may have a chance to fully transform, said Robert. And something was different inside the woods. Shantae and I walked back in complete silence with no flashlight. There are rushing, ethereal, almost metallic, but more like wooden notes that come from the forest. Seven, 
The world was ending, or something was. They went through a stone doorway, down into a crypt, but then they came back up. They were spinning me. I was flying through the air, or floating, and something was building. A feeling of emotional closeness was building, as though it could peak like an orgasm. Eight. Some nights have a Pisces taste and smell. Floating, hallucination, the threat of insanity. Nine, euphoria. We trespassed in the sculpture garden on the creek. Sunlight forming, dissipating, shadow of my head in the water. Surrounded by glittering sun reflection, animal cules streaming endlessly outwards. Faces too close to see each other. Kissing as the water moved deeply around us, urging us on. I kept thinking my head under again and again. 10. That Philly summer porch style, dogs and polycules, mesh skirts and crop tops and sunglasses and fireflies. No work and the day is 25 hours long. 11. We biked a different route through an empty, empty park, laying in the grass on a still damp beach towel by the fireflies and mosquitoes, grabbing control, mutuality, rest, movement, patterns, slapping, spanking on the butthole, reverberations, Shabbos. Before that, we'd been at the beach, topless, her carrying me, hugging and kissing, laughing, under and above water, losing balance, sunset, half sky daylight, half blue dusky light, and an old man. No one said anything to me and her, matching, matching each other, the water bringing out all the shades of red, orange, blue, purple, pink, yellow, and brown. Her eyelids were pink purple. Faces close, freckles, brown eyes, laughing, holding. 12. It was comforting to be among the giant metal architecture in the hand of the Goliath. The bridge tower shook when a train went past, proving durability. Kissing the spine of a rain-soaked cardboard Monsters, Inc. book lying spine up on the ground. Thanks for not getting caught. 13. I don't remember what my body looked like before. There is one more cover by Alejandra Pizarnik. Blank slate. Cisterns in memory. Rivers in memory. Pools in memory. Always water in memory, wind in memory, whispering in memory. Thank you. Oh my goodness, thank you so much, Lior. Um, this, it's, ugh, I'm so stunned by your work as usual and uh, everything from, like the spiritual to the political to the material. It translates through your words in a way that is so deeply felt as, as, as far as the marrow. And that's one of the many, many reasons that I love Lior Styler's work. Next up, we have Marcus Scott Williams. Uh, Marcus is the author of Sparse Black Whimsy, a memoir published by Too Fast, Too House, 2017. And damn near might be what it still, <clears throat> damn near might be is what it is um, by Naomi Press in 2022, which is forthcoming. He loves and appreciates you. Um, so with that, I want to welcome uh, Marcus Williams. Yo, thanks Drew. Um, also, thank you to the Brooklyn Rail and everybody um, that came came through today. Thanks to Benedict and Erica and Lior too. Um, Lior, that was so good. Thank you for that. I would love to read some more of your stuff um, in the future. Um, I'm going to, I was planning on initially reading um, a selection from the manuscript that's going to be published with Noemi Press in 2022, um, which is, and I'm sorry that I set you up for failure, Drew, the 
it, title is intentionally like um, worded that way. The real the title is "Damn Near Might Still Be Is What It Is," um, which is just another way of saying "fuck it, it's your life," you know. But instead of reading that shit, I found two things in my phone last night that I think are more appropriate. Um, and I'll read that. It'll be short and sweet. <clears throat> the first piece is called Block Meditation Number Two. When the night breaks and the sun slices, I become a cat perched on top of its fireplace, become the block boys below, their jovial radical laughter in the face of a pandemic, become the birds that been chirping, pre-slicing, hanging off cable wires and swang into apartment window, become the broken gate of the junkie who politely appreciates your change for a coffee, the man selling deodorant toothbrushes in front of the laundromat, vicinity rice and roasted chicken, the cashier of a threatened bakery, become the pavement that projects trap house mobs base into the scenery, the daily procession of motorbikes and ATVs become each inlaid brick and pothole and abandoned bike locked anciently to circular metal, become that green contained in the fine fair awning, the green that communicates development, unsaid, unsaid anxiety held in, held in by makeshift masks and gloves and person long distances. I resist becoming the warped siren squad cars patrolling like the world still the same. Resist the transformation of attitudes that that green enforces on future residents toward the current flow. Resist urges to judge outside understandings, to reflect the sterility of the sky into a gray human being, devoid of empathy, devoid of the magic that one collects from a solid smile or a dap in the face of furloughs. When the night regenerates and dominates, I'll transform, I pivot into nothingness, a nothingness that absorbs outside of anger into understanding. Absorb the purple and combined lights. Absorb the new shift, the new shifts of crepuscular block boys and their tenebrism, the quiet of the closed businesses, the smell of a stuffed backwoods meandering upwards towards heaven, pouring smoke out for the homies. Absorb the crunching of shopping carts, of heavy steel doors closing underneath their own pressure become the nothingless of starless city beaten purple skies until the night settles, curling, breezing. Time is dead, screamed from the purple outside. How do I continue to move and to be moved? This last piece is a freestyle that I found last night on my phone. Um, and the working title is like oil on turbulence. I'm gonna take a sip of water first. Like oil on turbulence. Breathing into me, fuck it. You know how I breathe, I don't know you. Sunlight halves my eyelids, my mouth is warm. Inside, not saying much. Difficulty in finding things to say. When I got washed away, I remembered where I was. I broke myself to see what's inside. It resonate when it's supposed to. Damn, you die, then it's up to history. I can't listen to me. Damn, I die, I'm up in history. I am not a nigga who can buy into whiteness. Motherfuckers can't bleach my aura. Ain't no longer on my tippy toes, feel feet flat stomping. I wanna make entirely intimate things. I wanna make real things. You can only really make things that people will call real or relatable by using the tools people are comfortable with using, you feel me? I wanna have the courage to make whatever society expects of me malleable. All this shit made up anyway. Made up on me, not real, it just means invented. And so it's like, all right, boom. Every moment I'm living, I'm living. No God on cap. None of that bullshit, I'm gonna put it all on me like accountability. I'm really, really different. From what I see, people aren't afraid of using the tools they use. What does acting natural even mean? What questions do niggas got? I think because I have bad spatial awareness, it's equally as hard for me to conceptualize the weight of something. 
because I can't really understand the size of it. When body is hungry, but I ain't in possession of an appetite, the path to fulfillment is a hot sauce sandwich on some real, real hood shit. Peep the moon pimpling that purple and gray, backlighting the spider plant, reflections thin into shuriken. When I learned today, what I learned today was that all communication sort of fails no matter the precision of language, issues and individuation. Body whispers into my lower and middle back. It's a little foreplay for now. I tell him, let's talk at breakfast. Heem tightens, sucks his teeth, your funeral. Body thanks me at breakfast. Although I still cannot find an appetite for the life of me. I can get a bereke at least. Some carbs and melt and require less chewing. I kiss all five of my right fingers together and use that to metronome my forehead. I'm inside with nothing but time, vacuuming the rug by hand on my hands and knees, sucking crumbs of dust and dry pieces of chicken and salmon, cat treats for my man Shinji. The world's a big place to hide in. Thank you. Oh my um, goodness. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Oh my goodness. Marcus, um, Marcus has such a talent for making uh, the material world we all live in, making Brooklyn, making New York City, uh, making all of these individuals with their lives uh, moving about through every day, um, making that into a personal interior emotional landscape. And it always amazes me to read and now, I feel so lucky to uh, hear, have heard uh, Marcus's work. So thank you again so much. Um, our next poet is Benedict Nguyen. Uh, Benedict is a dancer, writer, and curator based in occupied Lenape and Wapinger lands in the South Bronx. Their criticism has appeared in the Brooklyn Rail, Dan Space Projects Journal, uh, Shonda Land, The Establishment, Culture Bot, among others. Their poetry has appeared or is forthcoming in the Asian American Writers Workshops, The Margins, Flypaper, and Pink. They've performed in Dapper Q Fashion Week and in recent works by Sally Silvers, Jose Rivera, Junior, Monster Black, and more. As the 2019 Suzanne Foyle Curatorial Fellow at Issue Project Room, they created the multidisciplinary performance platform, Soft Bodies in Hard Places. They publish a monthly-ish newsletter, First Quarter of the Moon Slush, on Substack, and are sometimes online as at X Benny Boo, which um, I'm sure Emily will put in the chat. So welcome. Benedict. Hi everyone. I will I will stand. This is yeah. Um, that was this is my one power move of the day is to have the angle of the camera looking up at me. <laughs> I must I must make jokes. Um, thank you, Drew. Thank you for Leo and Marcus for your poems and sharing those. And I'm excited to hear Drew and Erica read next. Thank you to the rail. Um, yeah, uh, I will share my screen to read some poems. Can I? Can a girl figure out how to make Zoom work? Okay, share. I think we can see my screen. Um, the first poem I'm going to read is by my. Friends, one of my oldest friends, longtime collaborators, writing partner, um, the brilliant Stephanie George. Uh, this poem is called Regicide. Heavy hips hung low, I waited. An eager wave, an open fist, a closed slap, all loosened rings. I remember every crater scraped by half moon palms my skin hand walking through grooves where knuckles bled. I dreamt of regicide, 
my deep suspicion of kindness dethroned men whose eyes had fingers. And then I began landing. Thank you, Stephanie, for being, yeah, for being a reader of my work, for being someone I get to read and write for, um, and for letting me share this beautiful poem with today's enthralled Zoom audience. Um, shout out to the Zoom audience for spending part of your Zoom reserves with this reading today. Mine are limited. I had to turn my camera off. <laughs> Um, the next, uh, I promise Twitter, because I, I am sometimes online. This is, I don't, my sarcasm is not doing great today. <laughs> but um, I promised Twitter that I would read some poems about being online. And I unfortunately will follow through with that. Um, fortunately for you all. So uh, this poem is called uh, CO Catechesis. Mmm. Patient complains of a craving for complicity, considering emergency surgery to shut it down for a cost of $50, half a hundred delivered on a credit card, a key to unlock new consumption, passing yours, I need to get in the medicine cabinet, need to grab the bolt cutter so I can get patient comfort right away. Oh, you're past your shift. Well, I'll tell the accountant to carry over your hours over time. Note them on your log. Yeah, clock out as you normally would. Oh, patients calling, can't hardly wait. Must click clack through their cart, complete this transaction. One sec, yep, they did it. They bought it, pretty and fresh. Country of origin, Vietnam. Hey, my cousin was there, coincidences. Look, already got confirmation. Patient shipment to be sent soon. Care of me, their doctor. I love my job. Mannering the bedside as they make commands for consignment. Thank God I'm not the accountant. Do you know the difference between accrual and cash? Something to do with time and the future and the limitations of now and waiting and ever constant immediate gratification. Wait, sorry? Ah, the surgery, very complex. Only ever been carried out once, successfully at least. It's called decolonizing the mind, yes. Named after Nyugi Watiango. Fine, appropriated, but isn't everything copies of design and ideas sold or even distributed for free? That's why patient needs to buy more. Nothing coagulates better than contending, coaxing and committing yourself to the cost, which is never worth it. So they just have to try buy again till something collates a bit easier. It's like running your own company. You're your own CEO. You hire the good, countersign the contracts, give performance reviews, co-sign a lifestyle of taste and decadent services, competing against other companies for the chance to win. But it's also like dating, weighing people's collagen levels, and then postcoital tristesses, très triste, colossal epic tales of our time. Ooh, look, same day delivery, patients convulsing, this'll do. This'll coerce them to keep calm and date the top of the console with their co-optation. What a coalition we make. A cure, you ask? Just the surgery. Apparently you start out by cutting out the coccyx to construct contemporaneously a new spinal column. Uh, the next uh, poem is called To Service Our Knees. It was written um, during a class that I took with Marwa Hella last year. Um, Shout out to that class, it changed my life. Shout out to Marwa. Um, and yeah, it, it's after Sarah Ahmed, Jazz Beer K. Poir, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, and Shoshana Zuboff. Um, I'm not a theorist um, and this isn't theory, but it's not not theory. So I'll just, I'll say that. <laughs> One. Control find my body on the internet there. Bring up my Instagram phone on the cellular jugular phone. Are you horny for me? Tell me, I was supposed to be loud. Aren't you glad I'm chill? Sir, render me your plaything. Think I'm clever speaking, wearing me out, door voices. I'm your bitch. To look at oneself online is easy with the right filter. You can glossier me with your Sata mask. 
handshake emoji, pseudo intellectualism, prisms that all make us look worse off in the end of times, best of time to log off your knock off of a real life experience. Stare at the wall, see yourself in the dust flying in front of your interfacing. When the wave has passed, don't be vague. Two, there is no wonder on the internet of things, everything is tame. Everything that is related search capital is a relation between workers and good stuff. Goop junk, gunk sale. Internet is a relation between me and myself and my nice self agency is a relation between my possibility becoming ours and the post-structuralism. We need a cataclysm. The revolution will not be planned on slack off, really, please. Get off my dick, we say, when tired of fighting someone else. Remember, we used to go away. Anyone know a travel agent? Three, Agile Small got called assemblage, an array the internet beat us to a template for the surveillance capitalists army attempts to blue check you out and to service our needs. A bitchy email, handshake emoji, bitch into action. Let's us, we work together, steal a Bitcoin of theirs, make our own templates they can't copy, paste, save, close, open, full stop, couching everything earnest in this horrendous irony, alienating, hurts to mean it so bad. Easier to joke, LOL, is this behavior of surplus? 10001 New York zip code, me down the forever lane. The forever closed loop, for loop, take my data, bitch. I'll break your server and your service to adverts and convert them into new openings, handshake emoji. Uh, sorry, jobs for hire, handshake emoji, cracks in the system. And the last poem I'll read is after um, my friend T. Tran Lei, another poet. Um, we text and commiserate about the world and they were joking about, about um, I was telling them how I was taking an Epsom salt bath and they were talking about, uh, they gave me this prompt, a uh, poem from the point of view of a bathtub. And I joked, I was like, I'm gonna make this a poem and follow through with it and then I did, um, and this will be my last poem. Ew, this one is smelly today. Can you drain me a bit before dunking your bod so salty into my vessel? I'll give you some Epsom salts for your tension. Sum up the duds for your duds. Surfactant stripping your skin barrier. Nothing but the embalming heat to stew your anger inside your skin draining water out prune tips, shriveling everything but everyone else's messy hearts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Benedict. Um, TMI time, Benedict has uh, been a friend for a while and has uh, rescued me or been there for me, rescued me, fished me out of the toilet uh, for many of a, a breakup um, during this COVID time. And I, I'm so glad to see that again, once again, that their poetry is reflective of that deeply rescuing personality, uh, a way of taking something so alienating and depersonalizing as being online or the various uh, oppressions of kind of the, um, the commodification of information that we see on the internet to just regular everyday interpersonal uh, violences and turn them on their head with their humor. Um, <clears throat> so thank you again, Benedict. Our next thank poet you. is uh, my good friend and colleague, Erica. Uh, Erica Kielsgaard lives and loves in Jersey City. She teaches English literature and creative writing for CUNY and is an alumna of Brooklyn College's MFA program, where she serves as an editor at large for the Brooklyn Review. Her poems have found generous homes in Bone Bouquet, Cordelia Magazine, The Pen Review, and others. Most recently, you can find her fiction in Maudlin House. She's reading Magdalena Zorowski's pamphlet 
Being Human is an Occult Practice from Ugly Duckling Press and The Plague by Albert Camus in preparation for Laura Maris's new translation. So I'd like to go ahead and welcome Erica. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, Drew. And uh, thank you to the Brooklyn Rail and Emily and Lior and Marcus and Benedict. Those readings were just amazing. Um, I'm really excited for Drew to read too. Um, let's see, and I got my notes here because I need them. Um, otherwise I'll get lost. Uh, I'm gonna open with um, a poem that I return to often, um, really a book of poems that I return to uh, by Carl Phillips. The Rest of Love, um, I'm going to read If a Wilderness. OK. Um, then spring came, branches in a wind. I bought a harness. I bought a bridle. I wagered on God and a kind stranger, kind at first, strange, then less so. And I was right. The difference between God and luck is that luck, when it leaves, does not go far. The idea is to believe. You could almost touch it. Now he's singing, cadence of a rough sea, a way of crossing a dark so unspecific it seems everywhere. Isn't that what singing once was for? I lay the harness across my lap, the bridle beside me for the sweat, the color and smell of it that I couldn't by now lift the leather free of, even if I wanted to. I don't want to. Um, okay, and I'm going to read a poem of mine um, that I wrote with footnotes that I'm going to omit just to try it out. Um, okay, uh, to locate a relative distance in vectors, the direction of an intersection is significant to its measure. Variations in form of space and edges are all theoretical by nature of being unknowable. They must be approximated or assumed. Simpler then to imagine a sphere. It's said without irony in physics, assuming a spherical horse in order to solve for love. I don't trust in conversation. Ample is the opportunity for slippage, loss and inexpressibility. If the right word isn't unknowable, perhaps it is incomplete. When I say love, I am really talking about art. When I consider my art, I am really considering my potential to love. Someone wrote something interesting about love I can't remember. Sometimes I forget my own thoughts before they can become ideas. Entangled, love and art spell a revolt. Can the heart, once broken, recede into a horizon I can't identify to sigh and settle symmetrically? The edges of my vision catch on an exaggerated image. A preference for photographs over motion pictures is indicative of my inability to communicate sufficiently in the moment. I turn over a stone and find nothing good under it. What I wanted to remember about love is an idea Aaron Coonan had about trust in Love 3, that love is inauthentic because of past romantic failures, whereas I believe the opposite. Okay, um, all right, and now, I'm going to read some more sonnets of mine. Um, OK, uh, all right, sonnet. Look, as a white man with nice socks, you have a leg up in this business. I dreamed I was at the frick and drinking water continuously. Delicious. And it's true. I haven't been trained in anything. There wasn't much scientific discovery in the Middle Ages, watching bats screech and scry overhead. I admire your reflexes. Should we toss the mutual object? Let's go through our stuff together on the floor of our last apartment. My heart, I mean, broken neatly. My life, I mean, is an upward gesture. Um, okay, and here's another one. Um, the way I thought this was never going to happen again can manifest a tragedy or momentary rhythmic bliss breathing through a memory at once. In a world where people are wasted, by war, my love for you is irrational. At best, anonymous consequence. Irreversible will, your feelings, a seemingly opposed risk, limitation, like developing the meaning of a single word attached 
to an abandoned building. Okay, sonnet. Memory is depending on how to look both ways. Crack in the sidewalk I cannot crawl into, no matter how the body folds almost when numbing is no longer a controlled experiment and the solution occupies whatever system ascribed to it will crumble. Impossible to comprehend trust. I can inhale a peony and find an anemone out of water, but that's not enough to slow down the mind outside this view. Imitations to get in the spirit. We still project a body of being as entirely independent of the borderless topography we occupy. There might be a kind of grace in knowing when to leave alone what you can't possibly protect in this life. I have a great imagination, extending the moment between the will to fall and the fall actual. If a solar eclipse is a lunar victory, we're thinking in the wrong terms. What's the point? Isn't something I can say about anything. And last one, um, hope against hope. I translate in order to live. Death isn't a planned event. The smoke alarm won't stop chirping. I couldn't sleep all night since memory replaces intimacy, which is poetry. Peace of the Lord be with you. Little comfort for an atheist, naming the wheelbarrow Terra depending. Ultimatum implies a choice. However restrictive, that's not the case here. Fully aware of abstract pragmatism, my cat walks across the screen. Ooh, I lied. I have one more. Um, after Parasite. Uh, okay, one. Are those socks hanging on a light fixture or an image of Nepenthes? Whispers, please don't piss on my Basquiat for a false landscape stone. I have a plan, the depth of the unknown in full effect. Heat doesn't lie. Panties left in the car for a trap survive a change of ownership and dramatic settled to an actor's emphasis, glass accolades. Have you washed your hands? Two, I'm gazing at the sky from home. The truth is a missile headed for the basement, under the basement, where heroes garnish soup, cans, not prayer candles, collections of used condom wrappers on a receipt spike. The line between plan and no plan is the stone that clings to you, an architect's vision before it is thrown from the fire escape. Three, ouch, you hit my head. Our lady of Wi-Fi went out. An impressive friend, two links away, on a loop of recommendations, your belt of trust doesn't fit. Go to your playpen, oxymoron. I just want to drink whiskey in the rain. You don't. Understand, memory. I just want to smoke a cigarette. Kiss me again, before the blood runs out. Before the poem ends. All right, and I just wanted to read one more um, that inspired a lot of these sonnets. Um, so I'm gonna read from, uh, sorry, I have a little bit of a runny nose here. Um, Bernadette Mayer's sonnets. Uh, I'm gonna read two. Sonnet, you jerk, you didn't call me up. I haven't seen you in so long. You probably have a fucking tan. And besides that, instead of making love tonight, you're drinking your parents to the airport. I'm through with you bougie boys. All you ever do is go back to ancestral comforts only money can get. Even Catalyst was rich, but nowadays you guys settle for a couch by a soporific color cable TV set instead of any arc of love. No wonder the GI Joe team blows it every other time. Wake up, it's the middle of the night. You can either make love or die at the hand of the Cobra Command. To make love, turn to page 44. To die, turn to page 130. We're going to turn to page 70, though. And I just want to read the second sonnet from her sonnets. The landlord was thrown out of the rent stabilization group. It's impossible sometimes for the woman not to think of the landlord if he's a man as a father. That's what some of the old women in the building here have told me. You wouldn't want to live with him. This is why nobody ceases to pay their rent or goes on rent strike or is willing to face another father judge in the courts. Do you remember how your kids' teachers, if you have them, can make you feel nervous in that same way? The authorities avoid them. So it's right, the landlord is a man, his agent is a woman who is so pervasively divisive as to be unhuman, 
I won't talk to her, she makes me want to weep. I won't lie down, I won't give a tip to the landlord's pimp. Could this be a sonnet? I wander on it. Who is who and what is what? I don't live in this building by accident. This is my reservation. I live with the sleep alliance. I was reminded cars were when you crossed in the middle of the street and they thought I actually owed them something just at the moment they woke up to roar at me and you and perhaps eat us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erica. Erica's work has always amazed me. It's as if uh, she is the product of a love child between Borges, uh, Bartz, and uh, Kimiko Han. Uh, the layers of both intellectuality and like personal feeling are always uh, strike so deeply. Um, so I, I guess, um, <laughs> As the curator for this series, uh, I'm next somehow. Um, it, I don't know, Emily, if you want to say anything, but uh, I guess I can just start reading. <clears throat> All right, so this is my first poem and it is, uh, the first line is the title. <clears throat> Because of George H.W. Bush, I thought smart bombs were a good thing, like the American dream and McDonald's Happy Meals and democracy and a big house and the mortgage that comes with it and grocery stores with enough rice to feed a village and meat, not just on bet like mom had during the war, but every day and GI Joes from the cartoons of which the white boy next door had boxes full and took for granted, but dad thought were too expensive. So I got sack loads of green and tan army men that came with flags for each side, like old glory for the good guys and Vietnams for the bad. Yet this was peace and we had all the things my parents never did during the war. So dad voted Republican because it was Nixon who'd ended it after all, though Saigon fell under Ford. And I barely remember Operation Desert Shield, but don't you think it's the bad kind of mixed metaphor when a shield becomes a storm? I remember an ABC or NBC covering it and General Schwarzkopf saying, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you a picture of the luckiest man in Iraq and mom cringed and didn't want to look and turned away just like she did during Bosnia. But dad bought me the Gulf War four pack VHS set and I was only four. But when I turned five, it's all I ever watched because Barney never did bring on a Vietnamese kid like me. So I was obsessed with machines like the M1 Abrams main battle tank and the F4 Phantom in its wild weasel configuration and the B-52 Strato Fortress, both of which mom recognized from her war, which is why it was all so hard to watch, but dad said they had smart bombs, so it wouldn't be like it was in Vietnam. When you believe there's such a thing as a smart bomb, you can believe in such a thing as a good soldier, even though your mother never believed those words should ever be conjoined. Because what is good about a soldier drafting a 17 year old to go and fight in Cambodia when the war should have been over years ago? She left with her whole family and they came here where the grocery stores dazzled her and there was so much promise, but they still cleaned fast food joints after hours because they were and all they were in the end was just another cheap source of labor and her brother died anyway, but in a lover's spat and she worked and worked and by some sick cosmic joke, she married a man from the other side of a civil war and got a job in the defense and industry and gave birth to three children and two out of three joined the army and she had to do all that just so she could qualify for a mortgage on how she'd end up selling anyway just so, so she could have a little of all that food that would get thrown out if she didn't purchase before the sell by date just so, so she could carry so she could worry about another pair of kids about to go off to war 
the day, the day George H.W. Bush dies, they fly the flag at half mast as if the drug war never happened. My Twitter friends, their well-meaning people say, now that was a president. Look at his poise, his civility, his fucking socks. But they've never fired an M395 precision guided mortar munition at a target only to miss by a full kilometer. And how surgical is a smart bomb if the kill radius is 70 meters? And how many schools and roads and toilets and hospitals could you build for one Tomahawk cruise missile? I tell my friends that I want to write a poem titled, Because of George H.W. Bush, I thought smart bombs were a good thing with the lines in hell. I hope the GBU paveway twos are precise enough to pass through your asshole for an eternity with surgical precision. But the kill radius of a stanza like that would be smaller than the real thing. So I say, let's remember the dead presidents and the future dead presidents for all the things we thought were good, like money for college and the guarantee not to be vaporized on your way to school and the white picket fence dad lost in the bankruptcy and how all those things made mom forget no matter how hard she tried to save my uncle. She still had to clean out his bedroom when he died. He fe she still feels it today like shrapnel from a bomb dropped decades ago. And it's still lodged in her side and mine. <clears throat> my second poem is titled, How to Remember Your Ancestors' Names. One. Your mother says her grandmother, your mother's father's mother had hair, the color of blood spilled, moon skin, a bridged nose and no words. Another missing term, a person stitched together from foreign bodies. You'd envy her features pale were the cost not so dear. In her portrait, she looks away the same way mother would on her worst days. You wish you could read her the sutras as mother once had, giving her letters needed into a sentence to save you both. But her image tells you nothing can undo seam sewn, then torn. Two, and what do they say to the little yellow men on the ramparts of Verdun? I'm not a historian, but a childhood spent force-fed movies about mass murder opens a window for me to imagine they tell these soon-to-be corpses to be brave, but not in a familiar tongue. Haidung Kamlen. Instead, I imagine those pale officers say, be brave, be brave, be brave, but not the kind it takes to shrug off colonial yoga from your shoulders, not enough to make a country from the spirit of an emancipating page, not enough to say no, no, they lash these tirailleurs Indochinois with their naked European tongues. Bayonet au canon, on n'est pas pas, pour la France. A choice between steel, the Bosch's bullet and blade, or the master's firing squad and guillotine. And one in three will die their mother's names on their lips. The warmth of shrouded suns and flooded plains and star anise. A last mnemonic sensation before drowning in the absence of everything. But the rest will wait their turns for one war to metastasize into the next. On and on, but these little yellow men will not be remembered in the films pink face boy you kiss rosaries and pray to saints bones enshrined inspired crypts but no one says the prophet shahada nor the heart sutra and if their blue eyes don't look to God. They stare into lovers' eyes, clasped in lockets and wallets, held against the breast. But those so cherished are too light-skinned and eyed to look like Bakong Wai, with her heirloom despair passed down and down to mother, to me. And she tells me great-grandmother was a pariah for reminding her kith of the boots on their necks of the thieves in their coffers, the seeds in their wombs. For that, they, she'd been wed to another pariah who'd taken up that colonial rifle and the thousands like him sent 90 fold to dig their graves like veins through dysenteric earth from Belgique to Suisse. <clears throat> 
but no one remembers them. The books I read rem memorialize their spades, but not their uniformed ranks. Though they died, as Napoleon said, for a piece of ribbon they'd hoped would make their people free, the invisible notion of liberté, égalité, and fraternité, words to which they were never entitled. No little yellow man could defend Marianne in her Phrygian cap for such an act would sully that pristine ivory flesh. Such an act reflects guilty men's fears that what they'd done to us, we would revisit on them. When the great war ended, those little men took their bits of ribbon, braided those useless pretty strands into a hangman's rope, strangled an empire that had been too quick to collect the blood tax, but loath to ever give up their enlightened promise, live up to their enlightened promises for that like a criminal washing gore from their hands, the Metropole erased their subjects' bodies from the poppy-sodden fields fed on indigene meat. But to take up arms against an oppressor means to take up his fire and powder, and such wrath meets erasure with erasure. So I cannot know if Ongongwai had bled over Flanders' fields because our self-appointed liberators remembered the panoptic gaze of that blue and white white and red banner and chased all trace of that crippled empire from collective memory, chased the tens of thousands sent to the Western Front. My family burnt every document and photograph and medal to escape another oppression masquerading as liberty, but it had been too late marking my mother a felon across generations and I suffer no such brand. Yet I carry great grandfather's crimes no less. I can't tell you which letters and tonals and syllables make up his name. I can only say when I was old enough, I also took up a rifle in the name of another falling empire. I did not know my inheritance, fighting for a cause no one believes, yet it rattles through our throats without regard, lying in a hospital bed, mother beside me. She was afraid she would never have the chance to make amends, told me this hidden detail five more years before I saw his photograph alongside Bakunwai's. Mom doesn't like to talk about the war, her parents the war or her parents' war or her grandparents' war, though what threads us together all, you'd think that would close the gulfs and chasms between us, but I've long since learned that N common pain glues no one together as much as I want to believe that I would understand the hollows and rises and caverns of their inner lives. I cannot. I only have this story, bits of sh shrapnel scattered through my family, pieced together but never whole, the explosion that tore its way through our roots, detonated so long ago. I cannot tell you whether these bits of steel I find in my limbs belong to me or my countrymen, all so erased. Three, I spell my great-grandfather's name with exposed skin and bowing hairs beneath a mountain sun. My boot treads biting strange soil are his, setting foot on a country that called ours possession. And though I can't possess the memory, I see him in terraced Afghan fields cut up a hillock sloped side. I see him in the farmers passed on patrol. They are him shearing wheat from root ankle deep, gathering sickled rice soldiers like me as common as the meadow lark in spring fields foraging and of theft. I wonder if he ever killed a man. And if that were true, I want to locate that slain soldier in western trenches, a yellow fist strangling a knife grip, plunged between white ribs, piercing white skin, making made whiter with blood, lost though I know I'm projecting a past premeditation because the governor general left battalions behind garrisoned not to protect but serve the eternal master's fear of their subjects' crescent blades. But I know a nearer truth exists between brothers set one against the other. I 
I know what it means to take the master's lash as your own because I've done the same. My body never lies every time I'm afraid to look my mother in the eye, great grandfather, listen. Your war's children have cut our language from my throat. We have only tongues shrapnel cleft. So here instead, tone and timber let sound express regret for committed crimes between shores, both foreign and domestic. But you should know because my trespasses run so deep, I am alone. I imagine everyone is a murderer who hasn't had the chance yet. This isn't a confession, dear grandfather. Think instead of the oily fog from a stick of joss on our family's altar where I write your memory, an offering unlike fruit that rots, cigarettes that spoil, spirits made homeless. This offering remembers when we are alone for our trespasses and when our names are misplaced. Four. In this incarnation, I look at great grandmother staring out from nearly a century away and compare our faces in the mirror. When I was young, I wanted nothing more than for my face to blossom from teenaged pores into what I saw on TV. I insisted on getting limp locked haircuts that never worked, planned to change my name to something French like Janine or Helene or Emmanuel, the highest compliment I ever received from a girlfriend of 1.1 months about my blood, one part white, 23 parts Viet. I always thought you looked European. When I was older and read more, I'd revised my desired name change to honor back on wise father by taking his pork, cochon, or whatever that filthy language calls swine. I know I am just a recent ripple of in a pool of blood. I am not possible without that oldest of weapons, not the rifle, nor blade, nor club, nor stray stone, the only weapon that at once makes and takes life. So shouldn't I try to be more generous? But I compare her to me side by side, so little shared full lips and pale skin and a fold over the eyes, but her image, my reflection, a sheet of glass, a thumbnail of paper, an un unmistakable resemblance, five. In an alternate reality, Bakungwai feels no pain. When her mother tells her about her father, she's wistful. It had been love, not rape, that had joined the two. And there is no colony. There is no war that creates a war that creates a war that creates my war. There are no white skinned men who lord over stores of rice they'd never sown, nor firebrands plotting liberation that isn't needed, nor empty bellies, nor a million famine dead graves. In this reality, my great grandmother is not herself but a woman who chooses and great grandfather chooses and they do not choose each other because they are not pariahs in this reality. She is not illiterate. In this reality, she takes up the gifts I've ignored all my life. Her keen eye and pen and sheaves of a blank book. And I imagine she writes a lyric for me, not as I do for her in death, but imagines me alive. And on that page, I flower from what would have been despair. In this reality, there are no secrets kept well past their expiration. There are no histories to uncover. There is no shame buried deep within those histories. In this reality, she she takes her morning tea on a veranda of a home that never existed in ours, listens to a sea no refugee ever crossed, bites the dribbling yield of soil that's never been seeded with bombs. She wonders who I might have been as I wander her back to light a life never lived in this reality. Let me meet her on that empty shore, forsake life for her sake. 
Let me pay that price. Let me ease the stranger's way. Let her peer into the camera lens, see a future undone. Here we are birthless, deathless. Here we are together in what, what never was. Her letters tell me who I am. Here she has every word, so many beautiful words. Here she tells me her name. <clears throat> My last poem is titled 10 Reasons to Sell Your Ass Online. One, I've touched many lovers and won't touch another like a burrowed tick. Refugees flee to murder months underground. Outside cats yowl, trees blooming mate without shame. Two, Boy lovers, I made them press me to the wall, legs torso wrapped, see me off to war. I'll come, not home, not lover, not yet, doesn't call, and I don't mind if he never will. Three, I had a dream we were 16 and I'd turned, fossil buried deep, leather skinned off flesh, my pubescent bones surrender to a virgin, self-made shame, deeper comfort than lust. Four, confined, my lips scream for blood red, smeared rouge, whore legs open to the world. I record inchoate lusts, send them to every eye, a cable, a bird, a song to carry home. Five, mama denies the sum, two daughters and Two sons and a daughter equals two daughters and a son. Isolate the variable, paper dolls, a Boy Scout's knife, my thumb sliced clean. And what's lost? Nothing that lasts six. I masturbate to lost time, oh temporal phallus. I swallow nothing whole. Snuff film, the stock market careens on IV drip. Dopey veined, I sing a climax. Took you long enough. Seven, this nude currency, I flood the market, long a schoolgirl's longing, my body valued and shorted and speculated upon, long for heavy hips, chest full of crying over broken things. Eight, my teen years lost in no man's land fall one score and 10 years later, 10 years later, count his teeth, Grave, lane, red pe petaled laurel, pressed tin disc, artifact strewn, twist twin sister remains by and by nine. God damns fruit, Eve barefoot locked out my body's dissociative, disordered, dis desperate, filly, filthy Lilith makes a dahlia of one in four dead on unemployment rolls. One, I'm afraid no one will ever love me again. One, I'm afraid no one will ever touch my body again. One, I'm afraid my life has ended here where memory fades. One, I'm afraid. One, I'm afraid. One, I'm afraid. One, I'm afraid that this feels like home. 10, after the revolution, I'll be rich in lovers, standing, pens, ink, and memories, not mine. Our roles reversed, now the master of ashes. I've lived through worse. Mama reminds me that after the revolution, I'll break the, the ax, fascies of good intention, snapping as I cut the ribbon. I, my own thief, coquettes for eyes and nose and lips. It's okay, it'll all come out in the wash. And after the revolution, he says, come and see my broken bro bone tresses, a rib cage for a wall, my blood to wine. This land is yours and I am my mother's daughter. The waves submit to her gaze and take me home. Thank you. Um, on a brief note, the first poem, uh, because of George H.W. Bush, uh, I thought smart bombs was a good thing, was uh, miraculously and, and mysteriously published by the Air Force Academy's literary journal. So um, <laughs> thank you for your service, Air Force Academy, I guess. Thank you so much, Drew. That was such an incredible reading. I'm like reeling. 
Um, and thank you for bringing everyone here today. Um, thank you, Lior. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Benedict. Thank you, Erica, um, for amazing readings. Um, before we open up the floor for goodbyes, um, this October marked the Rails 20th anniversary and we'll be celebrating all the way into 2021. Please consider making a year end contribution to keep the rail and our special projects free, relevant and independent like the NSE lunchtime series and We the Immigrants Project. Every amount matters to us. Our goal is to double last year's participation and reach 500 donors um, and check out the chat for more information or ask one of our team. And please join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for Common Ground, curatorial activism slash decolonizing curating, a conversation on indigenous curatorial practices featuring legendary curators, Wanda Nanibush, Paul Chot Smith, Megan Tamadi Quinnell, and artist Richard Bell in conversation with Maura Riley. We'll conclude with a poetry reading by India Lena Gonzalez. And you all should now be able to turn on your microphone and say goodbye as you leave. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, Thank you, Drew. Thank you Marcus. Thank you, Leo. Thanks, Marcus. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes, the audience for being so kind and wonderful. Thanks to everyone at Brooklyn Rail for being so supportive and um, uh, patient with me. Um, Love and it. special thanks to Fong who uh, asked me to curate this event. It was just so, so special. And I, I really, this has made, um, made the beginning of the year quite, quite wonderful for me. <laughs>